Good morning, Waterline. Welcome back to the second message in our series, In the Beginning. In this series, we're looking at the beginning of creation, the church, and the beginning of Waterline, and how it informs how we can move forward in this new chapter God is calling us to together. Last week, we looked at Genesis chapter 1 and how God was there in the beginning of creation. He had a plan, a vision to see the world created. God saw it in his mind before it came to be. Then he spoke it into existence. He got involved in making it a reality. And we asked the question, what is God's vision for your part in Waterline's story? Today, I want to look at the only other chapter of the Bible that begins with the words, in the beginning. John 1, 1 through 4 says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. As I meditated on this section of scripture this week, I was reminded of Jesus' words in John 8, 12, when he said, uh, again, to the people, he said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. In John 10, 10, we read that Jesus said, I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. This is the life that we talk about in our mission statement. Waterline Church exists to inspire people to love God and love others, bringing life to every neighbor and neighborhood until God is first in every heart and every home. So I asked myself this question. What is this light of life we're supposed to have? And how do we get it? Let us pray. God, we thank you for your work in our life as a church and this story and journey that we're on together. We pray that your word uh, will, will penetrate our hearts and we thank you it does not return unto you void. It does what it's intended to do within each one of us. Have your way. Amen. So what I would like to do today is share with you four decisions we make to allow the word to become flesh or life, so to speak. So they are easy to remember. I'm going to give them to you in the form of an acronym using the term WORD, W-O-R-D. The first decision I'd like to focus on is that of our W, and it is worship. Worship is an integral part of allowing the word to penetrate our hearts. It's a tool to help us reflect and meditate on the principles and attributes and character of God. John Smith Frazier, a United Methodist Church pastor in California, has a definition of worship I read a long time ago and I've made it my own over the years. He says, worship is a natural response to a love relationship with God. Our love for God should cause both our inward and outward lives to glorify Him. And we're not just talking about music or the arts or even just Sundays. Let me take you to another scripture that also helps to define worship for me. James 1.27 Pure and undefiled religion in the sight of our God and Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their distress and keep oneself unstained by the world. The word used here for religion is the Greek word threskia, which means religious or corporate worship, especially external, that which consists of ceremonies and religious discipline. It's corporate worship, but there's no mention here of singing or dancing or shouting or crying or even hopping. Simply stated, this verse tells us that one of God's definition of pure and undefiled worship is serving the poor and marginalized and guarding against corruption in a godless world. I guess we can say that worship can be summed up in Waterline's mission statement to love God and love others. To allow the word to become flesh in us, we must decide to make worship a part of our daily lives. Okay, 
We've got to keep moving, but we're going to go over this again in our uh, home experience material. So let's go to the second decision, which helps us to allow the word to become part of us. And it's our O, obedience. We can all pretty much give a general definition of obedience, but have you ever thought about the fact that there are different motivators to obedience? Things that make us do what we do. These three motivators actually even have a hierarchy. Obedience out of fear, obedience out of selfishness, and obedience out of love. Obedience at the level of fear is when we obey because we know what will happen to us if we don't. We learn this at an early age. Don't touch that or I'll tell your father. In the church it looks more like, don't sin, fella, or you're gonna burn in hell. <laughs> the second level of obedience is that of selfishness, which is we obey because we know what we will get in return. The difference between the level of fear and the level of selfishness can also be easily demonstrated in our children. Some children obey parents to avoid discipline, the level of fear. Other children will obey parents to incur favor, the level of selfishness. The sad truth is that many Christians never rise above these two levels of obedience with God. Some obey God only because they fear the judgment. Others obey God only because of the promise of blessing or eternal life. But there's yet a higher level of obedience, the level of love. This is the highest level of obedience. This is where we obey God because we love Him and will continue to obey Him no matter what the circumstances or outcomes will be. It's the same motivation we see in a healthy marriage. It's the love that I have for Elizabeth that motivates me to be home on time and buy her flowers and empty the dishwasher. And it's her love for me that motivates her to support and care for me and maybe go on walks and walk the dog with me now and then in the hot sun or have patience as she needs to continue to raise me into a husband. Neither of us do what we do for each other out of obligation or fear. I think we can all agree if fear or obligation is a part of any relationship, it's likely something to reevaluate. If we truly desire to allow the Word to become flesh, one of us, we must learn to obey Jesus out of love. The third decision we must make to allow the Word to become flesh in us is the decision to embrace repentance. Now let's be clear right out of the gate, repentance is not sorrow or simply saying you're sorry. 2 Corinthians 7, 9-10 says, Yet now I am happy not because you were made sorry, but because your sorrow led you to repentance. For you became sorrowful as God intended, and so were not harmed in any way by us. Godly sorrow brings repentance that leads to salvation and leaves no regret, but worldly sorrow brings death. The next verse, verse 11, tells us what true repentance looks like. I really like how Eugene Peterson puts it in his paraphrase. And now. Isn't it wonderful all the ways in which this distress has goaded you closer to God? You're more alive, more concerned, more sensitive, more reverent, more human, more passionate, more responsible. Uh, you looked at it from any angle, you've come out of this with a purity of heart. And that is what I was hoping for in the first place when I wrote the letter, Paul said. So, in other words, repentance isn't just feeling bad, but a love for God and others that motivates a change in our behavior, which brings us to the last decision we need to look at in finding how to allow the Word to become part of who we are. Our D is discipline. Again, Eugene Peterson paraphrases 1 Corinthians 9, 24, 27 this way. You've all been to the stadium and seen the athletes race. Everyone runs to win. Run to win. All good athletes train hard. They do it for a gold medal that tarnishes and fades. You're after one that's gold eternally. I don't know about you, but I'm running hard for the finish line. I'm giving it everything I've got. No sloppy living for me. I'm staying alert and in top condition. I'm not trying to get caught napkin, telling everyone else all about it, and then missing out myself. 
When we talk about disciplining ourselves as Jesus would have us, we're really talking about discipleship. Jesus showed us how important discipleship was by making it part of his last words he gave to the apostles before leaving them and returning to heaven. Matthew 28, 19, 20 records those words. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. So, in Christ's last words, he sums it up for us, the whole thing he left us to do. Go make disciples of all nations. In our home experience material this week, I hope to explore or what it is to be a disciple of Christ and elaborate on three marks of a disciple. A disciple is someone who abides in Jesus' words, loves others, and bears much fruit. We'll look more at that this week together. So what about it? Is the word becoming flesh in you? Is your worship overflowing of your love relationship with him? Is your obedience motivated out of genuine love for God and his word? Does your repentance produce a love motivated discipline that changes your behavior? Are you a disciple? Does your life shine before men and give glory to the Father or is your light dull? or dim, or maybe just plain out. Maybe today you sense something stirring in you, calling you higher, you know, there's a change you need to make. Don't wait. Now is the time to drive a stake in the ground and say enough is enough. If you desire to have your life become a light unto men, if you desire to make a commitment to let your life be a light, would you comment below with the word me? I know I want more of that. Or maybe you're watching on the TV and or you have us on your phone and you want to text the word me to 317-820-2757. It's right here below me. Allowing the word to become flesh takes time, but it does come when we embrace true worship, loving God and loving others, true obedience at the motivating level of love. True repentance, a love-motivated change in behavior, and true discipline, a diligent pursuit of godliness lived out as a lover and imitator of Christ. We're going to be reviewing and unpacking all four of these pieces, worship, obedience, repentance, and discipleship, one after another in our home experience material this week. Don't miss out on the conversation. This Sunday is just meant to be the beginning of a week-long conversation we have together as we journey into what it is to allow the Word to become flesh in us. Let's pray. God, thank you again that your word doesn't return unto you void. And I believe there are people within the sound of my voice that sense your spirit calling them deeper. And I thank you that you who started that work is faithful to complete it. And I leave, we leave ourselves in your good hands to complete that work in us. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, what are I? I love you, I love you, I love you. I can't wait till we're back together again. Thank you so much for engaging in this with me today. And I can't wait to see you this week in our home experience.